All right, welcome to part four of Enlightenment in a Revolutionary World. Now we're going to talk about the American Revolution. Now, philosophers like Voltaire and others expected monarch to be able to reform the existing systems, right? But um, the American Revolution was a direct result of when these kind of things kind of failed or were ignored. Uh, the Revolutionary War will come out of the wake of the Seven Years' War, which really kind of changed Europe fundamentally. For France, it was a very um, humiliating defeat, right? And they held a lot of resentment, and it, as a result, led to a, a uh, reform of, their, of the French military system. Uh, for the British, it, it led to a collection of a vast amount of new land to try and deal with the complications of administering this land and the tremendous amount of debt that they had built up during the war itself. And as we'll see, this administration will be tricky, right? Uh, the 13 British colonies had about 2.5 million people by the 1770s, mostly European and African. Uh, they weren't accustomed to interference from the crown. They had been pretty much left alone. Uh, from the times of their formation. Um, and so you'll see things like, for example, when the king will issue the proclamation of 1763, which will declare all the lands west of the peak of the Appalachians, mountains, lands gathered by the Seven Years' War as uh, Indian reserve, right? Recognizing indigenous Indian sovereignty. That is gonna anger many Britons there in the colonies. Uh, in 1774, the Quebec Act will reaffirm the old French legal system in that land taken from the French by the Seven, uh, by the, uh, seven Years' War, right? Uh, that'll reconcile and, and resound well with many of the French people, but again, it's going to cause a lot of resentment, right? Anytime that there's any attempt to control these British colonies, there's going to be an issue. They've been founded at different times for so many different reasons. Um, there was no sense of unity, and the British policy uh, was to uh, pass things like navigation acts to keep foreigners out, uh, keep crown taxes low, and uh, keep central rule pretty much non-existence. And so when central rule was even attempted, like for example in the 1680s when James II tried to consolidate the New England colonies into the dominion of, of New England under a governor named Edmund Andros, it's going to uh, lead to a lot of backlash, right? There's gonna be revolts, there's gonna be riots. And fortunately it won't last long because James II will be overthrown in 1688 and William III uh, will restore the powers to the way they were before. So after that seven years war, the British really needed to get the administration of their colonies in order. Right, it was completely out of hand. And so they're gonna to begin to try and exert that authority. They're also gonna to need to try and raise taxation revenue to pay for this massive amount of debt that they had built up during the war. So they'll pass acts like in 1765, they'll pass the Stamp Act, which will require all public documents to have a tax stamp on it. Um, this is gonna cause a lot of condemnation by the, uh, the colonies. They're gonna begin saying, hey, look, we had no say on this tax being placed upon us, right? Um, no taxation without representation. That's gonna to start to be the rallying call, right? Colonies are gonna to begin to assemble to condemn the act. They're gonna to begin to form organizations like the Sons of Liberty, which are gonna encourage physical violence against the stamp offices and the, and the tax collectors, right? And they're even gonna form a collective Congress the Stamp Act Congress urged merchants to refuse British imports, right? A embargo or a boycott. Uh, and of course, colonists refused to pay the stamp, stamp tax. The result was that in 1766, the British Parliament did repeal the Stamp Act, mostly on the behest though of British merchants who were losing a lot of money because of the boycott. At the same time though, Parliament passed the Declaratory Act that said, look, we're repealing this tax, but uh, this tax, but you need to understand we have the right to tax you. And so when they followed up with uh, uh, additional taxes later, it's going to lead to uh, more resentment. Ultimately, you're going to have um, so much resentment through things like the Boston Tea Party and and other uh, incidents as such. You're going to have the passage by King George III of the Coercive Acts 
a series of acts that were designed to get these colonies back in line, including closing the Boston port, who, you know, and demanding the repayment for the tea from the, that was destroyed in the Boston Tea Party, uh, depriving Massachusetts of its legislative powers, and even billeting soldiers in the city itself. So finally, on April 19, 1775, war effectively broke out when, uh, when Boston, which was pretty much under martial law, had sent forth troops uh, to try and capture uh, Sons of Liberty leaders in, in the small town of Lexington and an ammo cache in the town of Concord. Um, there was an exchange of fire between British troops and uh, Minutemen or colonists at Lexington. And then uh, there was a whole uh, series of guerrilla sniping wars from Concord all the way back to Boston, right? The die had been cast, right? War had begun. Now, the balance of the advantages uh, ultimately tipped towards the Americans, the colonists. I mean, yeah, it's true that when the war started, the British certainly had advantages in, in the number of men, the uh, its economic might. You got, of course, the powerful Royal Navy, but the Americans had the primary advantage in that they had a more simpler set of war objectives. See, they didn't have to win the war. They only had to not lose it, right? They had to maintain an army in the field and break the enemy's will to fight, right? That was their only conditions for victory, right? Meanwhile, the British are going to have to fight a war far afield that crossed an entire Atlantic o o Ocean, right? Intelligence reports and orders back and forth from Britain typically took six weeks to cross the Atlantic round trip, right? And then finally, in 1778, the French will see uh, a chance at an, an opportunity of revenge, and they'll actually jump in the war. Britain's going to find itself without allies towards the end of this, right? Um, the Revolutionary War itself is progressively going to get worse for the British. Now, this was despite the fact that at first it didn't seem like it was going to go that way, right? Now, uh, for example, uh, in June of 1775, the British did break the siege at uh, Boston, right? Uh, they uh, uh, defeated the colonists there at the Battle of Bunker, Bunker Hill, though taking heavy uh, losses in the process, but ultimately would have to abandon the city by March of 1776. Uh, they would capture and hold the city of New York for the entirety of the war. Um, they would chase George Washington and his army all the way across New York and all the way into uh, across New Jersey and into Pennsylvania, right? But um, but they couldn't quite just finish the deal, right? Um, once France got involved, then everything began to turn on its heels. The British began to operate a southern offensive, right? Um, the um, they were fighting in the south. Meanwhile, uh, the French began to get troops and munitions there. And finally, at a place called York, Yorktown, uh, the main British force led by General Charles Cornwallis will be captured in uh, 1781. And the British will suddenly find themselves in, uh, in a position where they're going to have to give it up. Back in, in Parliament, there was a uh, parliamentary um, Whigs by the name of like Edmund Burke and Adam Smith who were advocating against the war, saying, look, it's a waste of money, it's a waste of treasure. The will to fight had been broken. 